non sequitur. Your facts are uncoordinated. Warning. The following live stream is intended for an uncommon audience. Those suffering from religious ileotitis, idiotic use of the word scientism, or geoplanetary flatardation are advised not to watch any further, as this could result in symptoms including feeling triggered, loss of wokeness, or the need to comment in all caps. However, if you think bold ideas are righteous, unique perspectives are gospel, and strong opinions are sacred, then we say hallelujah. This is non sequitur. Never follow. And now, here are your hosts, Kyle Curtis and Steve McRae. The big screen will have um, the pictures that you uh, kind of go to, but I figure. Oh, are we cool? Well, that was, <laughs> well, that was your uh, that that was your behind the the scenes sneak peek here at um, this big machine we call non sequitur. Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Kyle Curtis. Steve McRae, I think, is here somewhere. I don't uh, know which side I'm on. I'm, I have yeah, to look at the, the video. Ooh, oh, Steve's on bottom today. Cool. And uh, in a second, we will have Tony Farrell in between a Kyle and Steve uh, sandwich. But we'll go ahead and say hello to uh, Tony and thank him for joining us. What's going on, Tony? Hey, fantastic. I'm uh, uh, here in the UK. It's about 10 past one in the morning. But us Egyptologists like to party hard. So, you know, I'm not that tired. I'm sitting here with a beer. I'm ready to go. Awesome. You know, does he remind you of anybody, Steve? Um... Like a, like a young Alex Botton. Maybe. Maybe. You know what? No yeah, the problem is you think everybody who sounds like that is Alex Botton. Well, it, it's the, it's true, though. Prove me wrong. It's no, it's true. No, that's true. I defy you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's good to see that you're still alive, too, Steve. I was really worried about you. I have another voicemail. I'll send it to you before the end of the show. Maybe we can play at the end. Oh, cool. Okay. Awesome. Um, we can do that. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at what we've got coming up for uh, the week. Big week. Tomorrow, we're going to go uh, with... Let me get my notes out here. I am so professional. Okay, uh, tomorrow is... Uh, Dr. Robert Sungenis will be back with us tomorrow. He will be uh, leaving the geocentric model for that debate. Uh, I think we got enough into that the other night, but he will actually be attacking, allegedly, Dave, who is a memorable character from our <laughs> long list of memorable characters on this show. Uh, allegedly, Dave joined us. He is a um, free man on the land, a proponent of urine therapy, and a flat earther. So, yes, um, I I love, by the way, watching uh, Doctor Sungenis's face when we told him that on uh, the the show the other day. Steve, did you see? Just it's like the color drain from. Yeah, uh, he was like, I don't think he was expecting that. I really don't. I think he, for him, he's like, okay, this is about this is a little much even for me, and I'm a geocentrist. Would you ever though? I mean, that's those are no. things, those are that's a triple whammy. That's just I mean, that's a, a trifecta. So that will be tomorrow at eight p.m. Eastern, and uh, Tuesday, 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 Tuesday. I am so excited for Tuesday. If you thought we have done dumpster fires before, I think you are just brace yourself because Tuesday we have cell phone, and I love telling this because it never gets. Uh, I never can control the way that my face contorts when I say this out loud, Steve. My, like, my face muscles still, <laughs> they can't get used to uh, saying this, but cell phone is a techno technology, air quotation marks, that allows you to communicate with those who have passed on by using four methods. You can use what's called a soul switch, which will give you a yes or no answer. You can use a soul keyboard, which will actually type back the answers to you. You can also call them, yes, call them with cell phone and speak to your people who have passed on. And then the last and final one is it's gonna <laughs> soul be an app. video. It's going to be an soul app. video, yes. You can um, video chat with anyone who has passed on to the other side. This will be a unpredictable type of conversation because it's, it's going to be me and Steve. There's no one that we're bringing in to 
refute their claim. I don't like people that play on people's emotions. And so if there is no good reason for Steve or I to buy into this soul phone, then it's on. So Tuesday at 8 p.m., join us for that. Yeah, I think I, I think the only thing we're, that we kind of disagree on, Kyle, on, on that particular cell phone, and either one of us could be right or wrong, and we don't know yet. Oh, I'm right. You, you think that you, you just think that they're all completely knowing this bullshit and they're all scamming people, and I'm just not convinced of that yet. I'm not saying that's not true. I'm I'm just saying that I think that one or two of them that are in charge of it actually buy into their own bullshit. That's and that's what's surprising to me, Steve. Yeah. Because on this show, you're supposed to be like when they cast us to to play the parts that we play on here. Uh, by the way, Steve, <laughs> Steve is actually owns a CrossFit gym in, in real life. Um, <laughs> and his name's Brett. I mean, how, yeah. Chad, how is Chad, I'm a Chad, but, uh, but, but you're supposed to be the smart one. I was cast to be the, the, the pretty goofy, aloof one. And you were the, the smart one. And you don't think that they know that there's no way that you can uh-huh. video chat with people who have passed on to the other side. I know it sounds, dude, I know it sounds absurd. And I, obviously it's complete bullshit. Okay. I'm not giving any legitimacy to this at all. Cause I used to debunk this kind of shit. I used to debunk long in the medium and other mediums and, and show people how these, these cold readings are done. And, and some of them are hot, but you look at, I think that one or two of them, they really do think that this is a legit technology. Now I could be wrong on that. I totally, and I, if, if I find out that they, they don't believe any of this stuff, then that's fine. I don't know how you would do that, but I, I think that that they I think they actually a couple of them do just by yeah. what I'm reading on them. We could have an entire uh, show on this, but just let me throw you want to referee this, this and one, we'll, and then we'll move on. <laughs> think about this: if you're in charge of this, right? Like you're the people who are creating this technology and, and marketing it. There's an easy way for you to know if it's something that you should believe in, and that is you've actually tested it enough to be able to put it out there in the public that you can video chat with. Your your relatives that have passed on. I, I, let me tell you, I, I I saw a guy last night, and he he runs a channel, and I've con- I, I contacted him. He does things on haunted dolls. Oh, and Steve. He takes he takes a radio, and he basically listens for dead people's conversation. I'll talk, you know, talking the thing. It's called radio something or other. It's bullshit. But again, I I I wasn't sure if he actually bought into it or not. Right, that is a different thing. I was like, this guy, I'm not quite sure if he's actually buying it or not. So every, everyone's different, but. Tony, would you would you agree though that some people really do buy into their own bullshit? Uh, yes, <laughs> that is that Absolutely. is that is asking the wrong question though. That is not oh. what we were talking about. Oh, what's the yes. question? Yes, some people believe in in crazy stuff, but if you're actively saying, "Hi, I have this technology that allows you to Skype with your grandmother that passed away," I'm going to know if that's possible because I created no, that they, no because they they read the data the way they want to interpret the data like this guy with the radio it scans frequencies and it picks how up how do you read a videos other than seeing the people that you claim well, you know it's not like this I, I i don't think it's supposed to be like i'm i'm having a conversation like if you're dead that's but not how i think it's set up to be we'll have to table this till tuesday because right. um, yeah we got tony here anyways good I leading though say, i just want to say chad i'm i'm ready to stick to the crossfit stick to the crossfit all right can, can, you, can you ask him, Monica? If, if, if What's that? Technology actually works. Can you ask him if you can speak to some of the Egyptian pharaohs for us and actually find out if they can tell us how the pyramids were built? Oh, that's genius! <laughs> yes, thank you. Hey, that's that's we'll be that. Sure, I'm I'm down for that. Sure. So, uh, no, yeah, we can move on to the next uh, the next slide. Uh, Dr. Misha Griffith will be joining us. The next day, that is Wednesday, we are going to be talking about the uh, the dissidents in the Cold War that uh, worked underground to. Uh, it was kind of it was a movement, and it's a really interesting story. I have been brushing up on it. It's uh, a lot of espionage type. Uh, the Americans. Have you seen the, the show The Americans? Kind of like that, but it, no. it's uh, she is going to be. It's her first time on the show, Steve. So we have to behave so that she'll come back. But anytime we get PhDs, we are not only surprised that we actually have more that are willing to come on, but uh, we have to keep them. So that will be on Wednesday, and then on Friday, Friday big day. As you can see, two years in the making, we have Red's rhetoric and Jaronism. They have not. Sp- had a debate in two years that has finally going to happen on Friday the 13th. I'm calling it uh, <laughs> Flat Day the 13th. <laughs> Where's my rim shot? 
There we go. Okay. So that's all that we've got coming up for the week. Big week. A lot of fun. Um, apparently, Steve and I yet have yet another point of uh, argument. And I, I, I hate to throw it out there, though, but I... I am three and oh. I'll be happy to make it four and oh. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, you haven't got anything right yet. So, wait a minute. I don't know where you get that in your math from, but um, polls, data, Twitter. Uh, well, yeah, but 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 the scientists let's, and the experts, I, I defer to. Yeah, them. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay, Chad. Let's get over. Let, let's get to uh, let's get Think to of experts. Let's talk to Tony, <laughs> right? Um, a couple weeks ago, we did a show with uh, Brian Forrester. I had spoken with Tony actually, uh, I think a few days prior to that. And he had said that it would be a, a good idea. And I agreed that he would watch what Brian said. And we would kind of go through that um, that conversation that we had and see if there was any merit to anything that was said on there. Um, I am actually, I have been waiting all week to find out if ancient Egyptians had Wi-Fi via obelisks. Um <laughs> So, this has been <laughs> this has been heavy on my my mind, Tony. Uh, but welcome, Tony. Is a he's in his first year at uh, Liverpool, the University of Liverpool, and we are very happy to have him and hopefully have a long running tenure with him on the show. But welcome, Tony. Uh, introduce yourself. Tell us why you decided that you wanted to come on this sh this show because I'm still wondering that myself. And then we'll get into it. <laughs> well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, my name is uh, uh, Tony Farrell. I am a postgraduate researcher at the University of Liverpool here in sunny England. Uh, and I'm my field of study is, is what I like to call peopling ancient Egypt. So it's more rather than looking at the ideology of kingship and religion, it's looking at the actual, you know, what farmers did, what mm -hmm. workmen did, you know, all this kind of thing. Uh, because that tends to get forgotten when people are talking about lots of things to do with ancient Egypt. Uh, so I'm looking at things to do with social life and economy, which we could maybe touch on. Um, but I also kind of came to this from quite a funny way. I've, I've always really been interested in ancient Egypt and ancient cultures ever since being a, a really small kid. And of course, in the 90s, when all of the work from uh, uh, Graham Hancock, Robert Val, all of these big names in what they you know, usually term alternative um, Egyptology or alternative ancient history uh, came out. I kind of bought into it because I, I didn't really know, you know that much. I used to think you know, what they were saying was gospel. And uh, it took me years and years and years to get to where I am now, actually taking a, a, a PhD in Egyptology. But as soon as I started to kind of study and look into this kind of thing, I started to realize that lots of things that they were saying um, weren't exactly, didn't correspond with the Egyptian material that was there, didn't correspond with textual accounts from the ancient Egyptians. And some of it was just, you know, flat out incorrect. So um, I've, I've had this kind of thing where I've been going down the official route, but I've always got the alternative thing. So I, I like to engage with the alternative crowd as much as I can. I, I, I'm on several alternative uh, Egyptology groups on Facebook, so I go on there and, and chat and ask questions about where they think they get their ideas from. Um, and yeah, and it, it, I saw that he was having Brian Forrester on the show and I tuned in, you know, uh, listening to it. And um, yeah, just some of the stuff he was saying, um, I, you know, I don't really want to say he was misrepresenting or anything like this you know you may have just got some of the information uh, incorrect mm -hmm. so i just thought it'd be a good opportunity just to come on and uh, and chat about this kind of thing and where some of these um alternative ideas come from uh, the history behind them all you know that kind of thing yeah and i have to um I, I'll, I'll go ahead and clarify for myself too because i think based on reading some of the comments from that episode that uh people think that I think that aliens built, you know, these, these ancient structures. And, uh, because, because I was happy to have him come on and, and talk about the, the, the Sphinx and the erosion in that does not mean that I buy into everything he was saying. I believe that there was a civilization that built the Sphinx before the one that 
we were told. That is the only aspect of that that I buy into. I don't buy into yeah. the elongated um, skulls. So uh, people, I don't believe in aliens. I don't think that, or I, I believe in aliens, but not that they came down here and that they <laughs> built structures and then left. Do I think that there's life on other planets? Absolutely. But um, no, I don't think that they built the uh, the Sphinx. So I think, I think yeah. with the aliens thing as well, you, you'd kind of hope that they had some kind of slightly more advanced material than pneumolithic limestone that was just yeah. kind of like laying around. You know? Exactly. <laughs> if if, you're, if they're going to come here, you know, build it out of like gold or diamond, that you would know, be like impressive. Adamantium or something like yeah, that. If you found like a quantum computer in one of the chambers or something, that'd be bitch. Yeah. Right? yeah. But, <laughs> but, so, uh, so I, what we'll do, uh, you've sent over um, a lot of pictures. So guys, We'll go ahead and transition him over in between the Kyle and Steve sandwich. And he's transitioning. Yep. <laughs> so I'm going to let you kind of, uh, since you watched the show with um, Brian Forrester, kind of lead off. We'll, we'll start there and um, wherever you want to begin with on that and kind of speak to those particular points. But, you know, actually, let me take that back. Let's start with the the, the erosion on the limestone. Let's go ahead and get what I think are the credible pieces of evidence for that. And then we can we can have that done and out of the way and then kind of dive into the um, the crazy and then come back and finish up with what is actually um, the case as seen by evidence. So yeah. in terms of the erosion on the, uh, the outside of the Sphinx, what would you say that could be caused from, if not water erosion? The, the erosion essentially all started from a, a what was a, what was an off the cuff comment by uh, a, an, an occultist researcher and mathematician named R.A. Schwaller de Lubitz. I'm not sure if you've, you've heard that name bandied around before. I have. Um, John Anthony he, West, right? Exa exactly. So de Lubitz made a load of um, uh, uh, books and did some research at all of the major temples um, in um, uh, Karnak and Luxor and places like this which he said were, um, had the, the dimensions of man kind of like imposed in their constructions. And you can see, if you just search online for his research, you see these like scaled pictures of looks on Karnak like with skeletons in them and, you know, just mm -hmm. putting all this stuff in here. Um, but he, when he was looking at the Sphinx in, in one of his publications, he made a, a relatively off the cuff comment where he basically said the, the walls around the Sphinx showed some signs of water erosion. And that was, that was essentially all that he said. Enter John Anthony West, um, who kind of took that and ran with it and um, got Robert Shock involved. They went to the Sphinx, had a look. Shock was one of those um, who, I think hesitantly at first, was kind of like, okay, well, here's, here's what this looks like. It looks like. Um, water induced precipitation um, and from this study that they basically said that well there was no significant rainfall that happened in this area at Giza um, and recently there's, there's, there's been no significant rainfall feeding it back the only significant rainfall that happened in this area at the time dated back to about seven to ten thousand BC around about this time so from there they basically said, well, if this is the case, if there's been no significant rainfall, then there go, the Sphinx must have been built in this time. Um, it's kind of, it was kind of picked up and ran with a lot, and lots of the alternative side kind of agreed with this. Um, but then, because it made quite a bit of noise, lots of other geologists went and had a look at the site and basically came to some differing opinions. Um, essentially, it boils down to the difference between um, wind-induced precipitation and water-induced precipitation. So what Shock was saying is that water-induced precipitation will cause, cause like the rounded um, mm. sides that you see to the stone and you, you know and the grooves that were in there. This would only essentially be caused by water flowing down these walls. Um, and there are stones at, in the you know the, the area of the Sphinx that show wind-induced precipitation which is basically slightly flatter um, surfaces. And so lots of um, uh, geologists were looking at the site saying, well, basically, shock hasn't addressed 
how um, these two things kind of marry. If you're saying that water um, precipitation causes rounded undulations, but there's also evidence of, of, of wind erosion there as well, how would the wind erosion not have eroded the water induced, uh, you know, weathering that was there from like 10,000 years ago? Um, which he, he didn't really, he hasn't really covered. Robert Schock has just basically said that this is the case and there's been no, you know, kind of like study or anything serious about that. Um, other researchers have looked at it and basically stated that it's, it seems like it's a case of um, capillary action with salt, which would get the exact same results as what Schock is saying is the um, water induced weathering. Um, so what happens is um, the, 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 the limestone that gives is pneumolithic limestone. So it's millions of years old. It was once at the bottom of the seabed. And lots of the limestone there, you can see the little pneumolithic fossils and, you know, everything in. And incorporated into this is lots of salt, you know, because it, it used to be at the bottom of the sea. And what essentially happens is uh, at night when you get dew forming on the surface of this sand, it gets sucked into the pores of the limestone and then when it warms up in the morning you know you get this capillary action effect where the water kind of like dissolves the salt crystals expand it starts to crack and break the rock and that's what can give the same effect as the water precipitation is um, that is seen at the sphinx area um, one of the things that shock also talks about is that the length of time that the sphinx was covered up um, there are a few references in um, Egyptian records to King Tutmosis IV clearing away sand from the Sphinx. And, but I think they kind of make a slight fallacy because they basically say, here's the records that we've got of when the Sphinx was uncovered. So therefore, it must have been covered up for this, you know, the rest of the period of time, which was thousands of years. Right. Um, don't know if that's the case or not. Um, but some geologists have basically stated that if it was um, covered with sand at that time and rainfall falling on the sand and soaking in, it can have that effect on the rock where this, these salt crystals expand. Um, you've got this constant action um, weathering the rock and you can get the same effect that way. I, um, I actually can uh, see that being a possibility. I can concede that that um, that makes sense the way that you explained it. And um, I haven't heard that explanation. So that I'm I willing to look one, of, one, of, one of the things, sorry, one of the things oh. that, they, that, that they kind of rely on that yeah. is, is essentially wrong is the, the, the statement of that there's been no significant rainfall in the Giza area for 10,000 years. I mean, there are, Dozen, I mean, there are dozens and dozens, and I'm, I, I can I can read one out um, now for you if you like of of um, archaeologists, Egyptologists from the 1600s up until modern day, all reporting torrential downpours at the Giza area. Um, one of them at um, Abu Rawash, which is a pyramid site a, a few kilometres north of the Giza plateau, um, when um, it's got an Italian name, and I can never pronounce it. It's Miraglia Goldi, something along these lines. Mm -hmm. um, when he went up there to ex excavate, Abu Rawash at the time was in a, a military zone, so they used to use the site for military training. He went there in 1957 to do a preliminary excavation of the site of Abu Rawash. He returned there in 1960 to uh, continue the work and do a proper excavation. And he said that um, basically just due to the human activity in the site and the torrential rainfall that has been hitting the site in the last three years mm -hmm. it literally washed away lots of the stuff that they had seen just three years previously it damaged the monument so much um that it had washed some of the stuff away um, i can see that uh, with, the, with the um like uh and i've heard that i've actually heard that aspect of it as well too that people have reported um over the past centuries that there have been you know, torrential downpours. I haven't heard the the asp uh, the part where you talked about uh, the salt content with the dew and then the um, being heated up. That makes sense to me. And so um, I can concede that for now, that would be a possible explanation for 
the erosion. Yeah. My next uh, point that is kind of a um, a point of contention for me is the fact that there are no records about it's it being built. The the Egyptians recorded everything, as I'm sure you know, in minute detail, and you can't find anything aside from you know some conjecture. There are a couple pieces that they could attribute to that, but nothing concrete. So, what would be the answer for that? I, th- I think that th- th- there is a lot of stuff um, from ancient Egypt that isn't recorded. I mean, there are, there are just as there are no records about the construction of the Sphinx, there are no records about the literal construction of the pyramids. Uh, there, there, are, there are some texts relating to this, which we, we, we may touch on. Um, but it's the same thing again. There's, there's no records about building Karnak Temple, about Luxor Temple, about any of the temples. I, th- I think from memory, there's a, a cure in Papyrus with um, a plan for the tomb of uh, King Ramesses the Sixth and Valley of the Kings, and that's probably like the only architectural thing that remains from ancient Egypt. So yeah, this this I mean there, there is no record of the the Sphinx being built. Um, I think the, the 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 only references to it. I think there might be one from the Middle Kingdom. There's a, a stela with um, an image of the Sphinx with two pyramids behind it. And um, then there's obviously all of the um, stela that were erected in the um, Sphinx Temple, as you can see just at the back of you. Um, this stela set up there where they, um, yes, <laughs> where it's, it's dedicated to um, uh, the Horem Aket, which was the name of the Sphinx in the New Kingdom. And you've got to think from, you know, if you're taking that the Sphinx was built in the uh, Fourth Dynasty, and it was connected with Capra, so you're talking 2600, 2500 BC. Um, the references to it in the uh, uh, New Kingdom are, you know, over a thousand years later. And it seems like that it was just as far off in the distance of time to them. Um, it, you know, it, it was sure. ancient to them as, as we're looking back on these things now. I, and I think the uh, the this allow, this is probably a good time for because like you had a, an answer for me last time. I have one for you this time. And the reason is because all of those structures that you named off were all built way before the people who ever claimed to build them build them. And they were all built by aliens. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah, yeah. OK, so uh, I, think and, and, I think we're break, getting down to it now. So uh, Absolutely. <laughs> so, Dave, let's put up a picture is. of the this uh, the Sphinx real quick so that I can point out my last points. Go ahead, Steve. I was just going to, this always comes down to aliens, does it? It doesn't matter what the hell you're talking always. about. It's going to be aliens. Always. <laughs> um, and, no. and, and we can't see. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm having Dave just put up a picture of um, this. Oh, well, this is just for, for right now, just put up a picture of the, uh, any, any of the, the ones of the Sphinx. Yeah, you, I, I, I think, I think out of any of the stuff that I sent over to you, um, I mean, if you just, yeah, okay. I mean, if, if if you can just if you just chuck them off willy nilly and then we'll just comment on that over there. Um, so, one. so my next my my I think my final question that, um, because even if you know being an Egyptologist, I don't think that you're going to admit to the uh, Hall of Records being underneath the left paw of the Sphinx. <laughs> so well, um, again, this this is one of those things that the the only. There, there are lots of Arab records where they basically state that the Sphinx was a tomb of X person, some some yeah. biblical king or some Arabic king or yeah. something like this. The only the only original thing with the Hall of Records comes from Edgar Casey, yeah, the, yeah. The, the psychic, and he said totally. there was this thing, and we're going to open it in this date, and it's going to save the world. The funny thing about that is that uh, I mean, obviously that was a joke on my part. But, I, I know, uh, I know. But I mean, but there are people like this is my 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 greater point to this. There are people that will actually take that on face value. Like I am, I'm horribly skeptical of of psychics anyway. But the fact that that comes from somebody so recent that already had are so many other prophecies to go awry and and still hold on to that and be pushing it because they are you know there are. I see petitions on the internet all the time about uh, petition to finally break open the left paw of the Sphinx and and reveal the world's information on the Hall of Records. You know what I mean? This is like 
Yeah. But uh, my last and final serious question on um, the Sphinx, as far as the uh, the timeline goes, the head. Uh, there are many theories out there as to what it was before, because I think pretty much everybody agrees that it, it wasn't originally what it currently is now. And what can be presented as evidence to that is the, the Egyptians were obsessed with uh, symmetry and you know, just everything being equal. I mean, their, their statues are some of the most beautiful in the world. They're just nearly perfect. And this is just, you know, way out of proportion. Do you have a theory on what the original, I guess, head, face, animal part was? Um, I mean, I, I think it is as it is. Um, oh. I, don't, I, I, I don't believe that the one thing that's reoccurring with people like uh, Robert Sharp, Graham Hancock, Robert Buffal is that the Sphinx was originally a, a lion. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it was then later retired by the dynastic Egyptians who just, you know, all came across with all the kingly trappings that this, you, 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 and they just decided to carve this statue into an image of them. Um, I, I think it's, it's this thing of um, you have this civilization that was maybe 10,500 uh, BC who inhabited the Syria Giza. They had a workforce enough that they were going to construct this monumental lion figure and they left absolutely no trace that they were there. I mean, you know, there's no, there's no pottery, there's no uh, settlement, there's no um, um, uh, food um, remains that have been left. When the, um, all the original Sphinx excavations were happening in the, the 20s, the 30s, it stopped when World War II was happening. I mean, they went, they went down to the bedrock. I mean, they, they went down as far as you can get. And the only kind of pottery fragments or anything that they found in there are, are tightly dated to the Old Kingdom. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, it wasn't built by, you know, this old culture. Sure. Um, I think one of the images that I sent through to you was um, uh, a picture of the, um, the different um, layers of the limestone that the Giza Plateau is made up of. And there are several uh, different layers. The very bottom layer of it is, uh, I think it's the member three layer, is extremely hard. And then you've got a softer layer of that in the middle. If you can, I mean, just behind your head to your right, as I'm looking at the screen, um, you can see just behind the Sphinx, the wall, you can, they're, they're kind of oh. going down slopes. Yeah, you can see that they're going down slopes like this. And these are the different layers of limestone deposits that are there. And the head, lies at one of the hardest layers um, that was there, which is one of the reasons why they say it's still in a relatively good shape, because it just hasn't really eroded that much, because it's a, of an extremely strong limestone layer, whereas the body uh, and the surrounding walls is extremely weak. Um, again, it just means that it, it just how to buy. I always think of these things as, as, as context. You know, yeah. you, you've got the context of the entire site, and whenever you take something like the Sphinx, or you take the Great Pyramid out of the context that it's in, and then start putting all of these tributes and everything like that to it, you can take it anywhere. Whereas if you keep it in the context of the site that's there, um, that's true. I, I'll, I'll grant you that, and I feel like a, I feel like I'm a meteorologist, uh, <laughs> yeah. having some uh, some bullshit from the. Yeah. We have some light, light precipitation. <laughs> it's just the, the, the only thing with, with, with that is, and this will be the last question before we, we move on to like the pyramids and, and get into some, some other things, just because I'm curious, why is this example the, um, the odd one out in terms of their proportions and symmetry? You know, because the, the head is abnormally small compared to the, uh, the body. You, I, think, I mean, is, is there like a, a guess as to why that might be? I, I, th I think one, one of the, the I, I say convincing, but the, the part of that, that I kind of buy into that the most is when you see it from above, it's actually been filled in quite a lot now, but around about two thirds down the, the haunches of the Sphinx, there was a gigantic crack in the, in the limestone. And, um, 
one of the explanations that I've heard of why they extended the body is just because this crack would have essentially made it too short. So they just carried on with the excavation of it because of this, this crack was there um, just to try and keep it in proportion, which didn't kind of work. Gotcha. Um, the, the, the thing is with the sink, it, it had so much alteration done to it. Um, as it, I think when people look at it and they see all of the blocks coming up to like the lower layers, they don't realize that that's all either modern restoration or older restoration. The, the, the original Sphinx was just carved out of the limestone bedrock. Right. Um, and who knows what kind of, as we're saying, with the quality of the limestone that's there. Um, the, there was a, 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 a quite a famous um, report just because there was an alternative Egyptologist um, um, involved um, where in the 90s, there was um, a report of a huge chunk, I think it was something like 300 kilos of one of the, I think it was the left shoulder of the Sphinx. Came kilos? Down. Kilos? Yeah. Well, what kilos. are those? Uh, that, that, I mean, a, a weight. <laughs> yeah, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I, I don't know, yeah, I don't know what sister would. But um, yeah, so, I mean, the, the, the Sphinx is literally degrading as we speak. And, and another one of the things that Shock hasn't really commented, commented on is the, um, the, the modern... Um, uh, damage that's being done to it. Um, if the, the picture that's behind you, if you were standing right there now and you went walking a um, hundred yards back, you'd be literally sitting in a pizza hut. Like the the the, the 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 city is encroached that much on the Giza Plateau. There's there's roads there, there's buses. So you've got to think of the amount of modern um, kind of atmospheric conditions that are hitting these monuments that's uh you never i've never heard anyone say you know what we need to drive up this property value a pizza hut <laughs> you, i think everyone's got this kind of image of egypt like um i was I, I saw it for the first time the other day have you seen the film despicable me yeah the, 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 i have the, not and right at the start of despicable me there's, there's a guy who's like meant to be the, the world's greatest um, uh, villain and right at the start um, it's all uh, about that the pyramids have been stolen and they've been replaced with big inflatable pyramids. Some kid <laughs> goes climbing on it and pops it or something. But when, when you look at that, the whole thing is just desert all around. And I think when people think of the, the pyramids, they just think it's smack bang out in the middle of the desert somewhere. Right. And as I said, they'll be amazed, just the, the pizza hut, everything. And you literally cross the road to the pizza hut, walk in the gate. And the Sphinx is right there. You could throw a stone. Oh, that's so bad. Yeah. But well, the thing is, though, I, I believe that we can all agree that the, that Pizza Hut would have been built about 10,000. <laughs> uh, the uh, But, I mean, a good example to, to your point there is about a year and a half ago, I think it was, when they discovered that, I think it was, you could probably correct me on this, but it was almost a 20-foot tall statue of Ramses the second that was uh they were they were fixing a sewer line or um like a septic tank or something at someone's house and they went to dig up the septic tank and the statue of Ramses the second one of the largest ones that have ever been found was just chilling right there beside yeah. the septic mm -hmm. tank so uh this is off of the point but I'm just curious when people are you know septic septic tanks can't be that modern of an invention you know i mean i can't even venture to guess as to how long ago that was first invented but that means that they were actively digging and installing these things with these precious artifacts and treasures and temples and everything literally right there beside where they were just you know putting a septic tank oh yeah i mean the um the causeway of the pyramid of Khufu, which is uh, the next one along from the big one behind you. Uh, they've never actually found the valley temple or anything for that because it's buried under the visit village of Nasla el Saman. So the village has encroached that much that it's, it's completely covered it. And that, uh, I think it was about 95, 97, they were doing um, some sewerage works, installing some new sewerage lines there. And they buried, but broke down into the ground and they hit some solid stone. And there's a great basalt pavement under there with old kingdom wall running next to it. And this is the remains of the, the, the mortuary temple of um, Khufu, of the Great Pyramid. But 
they can't excavate. It's, it's literally just underneath the town. <laughs> you know, they, they just can't get it. So they just had to carry on finishing the line, took some photos of it and covered it all back up. That is that is in, that is insanity to me. Like if I was the key, uh, the the um, the king of Egypt now, I would instantly declare myself Pharaoh and <laughs> move everyone out of every city and build uh, make Egypt great again. In, in this I'm area, it's, it's it's quite notorious in the village of uh, Nazla and Saman. I'll, I'll be careful about what I'm saying um, because there's been I think it was maybe two thousand two thousand and ten when I was over there. And um, a, um, a friend came to me and gave me a newspaper. This is I thought I'd, I thought you'd be interested in this. Handed me this newspaper, all in Arabic. I'm like, I've got no idea what he said. <laughs> Five houses up from him, um, there was a, a house collapse. Six people were killed, and um, because they were burying down, um, because the place is just littered with tombs, you know. So they were burying from inside their living room, going down, you know. 20, 30 meters into the ground. What? Uh, to try and to try and find, yeah. I mean, it, the tomb robbery and uh, robbery of the monuments is a massive problem. Right? Oh man! But well, when when you've literally got villages built, they just to your your right shoulder, um, the the temples that were there in front of the Sphinx. No one knew they were there until about 1920. Uh, there were there were houses built on the top of those. And it wasn't until they did some preliminary excavations and found them they had to clear all of these houses out, rehouse these people, and dug down and found all of that. Stuff there. That is baffling to me. That 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 raises a, I think, an important question: is when did we start as a society putting a value on these artifacts? Because nowadays, if you were, you know, trying to put in a, a septic tank or or trying to build a house and you cut in on a, you know, ancient temple it would stop right there you would have um you know unesco come in and and wall it off and it would be a world heritage site yeah. uh, but that that doesn't seem to be the case around you know the turn of i would say the, the 18th or 19th century they just saw this said well just move it over a little bit and put the septic tank yeah or, that, it was it was a completely different thing but i mean obviously back then um it, it, it was all to bring things back to museums, you know, people are getting money to go to Egypt, bring us back some lovely stuff to the collection. Whereas now, you know, every, everything that the um, Supreme Council of Antiquities yeah. have really, really sewn up there, you know, um, which is why lots of the problems kind of happen sometimes when um, alternative Egyptologists get thrown into the mix. They just throw up lots of problems. There was a, a case maybe about two years ago um, with the Great Pyramid. Uh, you've heard of the relieving chambers. I thought, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. The so point of the relief, stars. <laughs> in, the, in the relieving chambers above the, um, uh, uh, the, the king's chamber, mm -hmm. just for people who, who, who don't know, there are a set of small kind of like gaps, big, huge granite beams going across them. Um, and up there, there are lots of, um, workmen's graffiti. So the gangs that constructed the pyramids, they left like leveling lines. They put the name of the gang up on the wall. And um, there's been this whole conspiracy with them apparently being fake and you know all of this kind of thing. Some German um, alternative Egyptologists went over there, managed to pay off some people to get up into the the, the, the galleries above the king's chamber. And apparently they didn't really touch that much of this ochre. The, the quarry marks are written in red ochre. And they went up and scraped some off the wall to apparently carbon date it so they can, you know, get an idea of exactly when it was built. But this really had consequences for German archaeological missions to be, you know, so Free Council of Antiquities kind of thought that, well, who are these Germans that are coming in here? The German government got involved and were like, look, these people are just, they've nothing to do with anything official. And right. It gets, it gets really hairy. You know? Yeah, that, uh, that makes sense, though. Uh, I mean, oh, people are so dumb sometimes. Steve, did you want to look? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, well, you said there's you know, there a lot of encroachment on the city um, from these these um, monuments. Um, have they done studies of what's, how much is actually affecting it? And do they have a time schedule of when these things may not have been around anymore? due to um, atmospheric pollutants and, and 
obviously there's soot and other things that are just you know, causing angry uh, Germans scraping or, or Muslim or was it some 14th century Muslim that got pissed off and decided to carve the nose off? I don't know. Why. I mean, I mean, yeah, there's, there's a, there's a huge restoration project going on at the minute at the, um, the step pyramid out in Saqqara. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a, it's, a, it's the okay, oldest yeah. pyramid in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Not a true pyramid. It's a, you know, a step one. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's literally falling apart and they're doing whatever they can to kind of renovate it and to, 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 to keep it going. Um, Zai Hawass, the um, um, ex leader of the Supreme Council, the guy with the hat, you've seen him on yeah. the documentary. Um, you know, he's been relatively instrumental in trying to stop the roads that were taking the tall buses around from uh, all around the, the pyramids. So we actually, um, it was kind of, again, another case in point, um, there was a road that used to take all the buses around the Great Pyramid. He decided to get it removed, remove the road. And as he was digging it up, they found a small satellite pyramid at the side of the pyramid that was just buried under this thing, um, you know, for however long. So they found this thing there. But um, yeah, it's it's a constant battle because, um, especially with the state of Egypt at the moment, and there's not much security out there since the uh, revolution in 2011, um, and especially in sites such as like Abu Sia. Uh, what's happened down there is that lots of the local population have just started going onto pyramid sites and building new Islamic cemeteries out there. And, and you know, you're talking hundreds of people have been buried, and it's been a fight as, as to kind of like say, look, we've got to, you can't have these um, cemeteries here because this is an archaeological site, but it's kind of a bit late once the people are in the ground. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's it's this constant fight. That is difficult. I, I um I wish that they were at least one of the pyramids just so that we could get a glimpse of, you know, what it looked like, because in the uh, the descriptions of what the pyramids looked like originally. Um, and I didn't know until I started looking into this, but I, I don't think a lot of people would know that they were actually encased in polished limestone like the it looked like almost like a mirror. They yeah. um, they claim so it, the sun would hit it and reflect off of the outside of it. And I, I wish they would like do that to one of them, because that would be like beautiful to see what that looked like. Because if you're coming from, you know, back then there wasn't the cities and all that that were around there. You're traveling through this desert and all of a sudden you see this huge triangle mirror in the uh, I mean, you're going to not I don't think fuck with those people. <laughs> you're, I mean, you're, 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 you know, you'll be having second thoughts. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. If, if it's a big mirror, I will be, I will be up there in a heartbeat. I mean, the, the bigger pyramid behind you, you can see the, the top section. Um, that's still the original casing stone. Did it uh, used to be marble for some of those in the capstone? No. No, it was, it was all of the casing stone came from Chura, which was a quarry, you know, a few miles away from the Giza area, where the so, limestone so, was really no really none. High quality. So I always thought the pyramids. I thought they originally had the uh, the top stone was uh, marble. Was made. No, marble. there's there's lots of. Um, you always hear this thing about the Great Pyramid had a, a golden capstone on the top of it. I mean, I thought it was marble, not not golden. But okay, there's, there's no evidence for that at all. There is yeah. evidence for some of the other um, 12th Dynasty pyramids that had um, basalt capstones. I mean, the, there's some of those in the Cairo Museum. Um, so some of them did have capstones on them, um, but as for the one at Giza. And you, another little known fact is that the, the Great Pyramid is also not a four-sided pyramid, but an eight-sided one. Uh, well, ah, I mean... Ah, good. <laughs> good. Go ahead. It, 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 it's kind of four-sided. Um, the, the, there, is, there is a very, very slight concavity to the pyramid. So if you, if you get them in the right sunlight, you can see... That there's a, a, a not particularly of, flat a shadow on them, which which was just a really good method for holding the case and so. But you know the the Great Pyramid it has these you know concavities to it. The uh, Red Pyramid at Dashur has them. The smaller Pyramid of Menkaure, um at the Giza Plateau has these concavities. So it's not like a a special thing. Lots of the pyramids have these uh, concavities. Everyone just latches onto the Great Pyramid because then it, it kind of because it's great. 
because totally it's the great yeah. one. Yeah, it's great. Let me let me ask you uh, the, the 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 Dozier pyramid, the, the one of the step the first step pyramids. I think it actually was the first step pyramid. Yeah. Um, uh, is it a completely coincidental that some of the other pyramids in Mesopotamian regions, uh, such as the the uh, the Temple of the Moon, uh, in, I think it's in Chichen Itza, uh, it, the very similar structure, and there's many many other types of pyramids that are very very similar in that structured step formation. Uh, is that just completely coincidental because this is one of the easiest things to build and why 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 would they why why did they have that particular type of um, structure what was it to to symbolize and why was there so much in egypt and in mesopotamia in, not, well, not mesopotamia i'm sorry in uh, mexico america, really central america. yeah I'm, I'm i mean i'm not entirely sure of the connection with um uh, south america um because then we've got to get into this kind of like culture where was this knowledge coming from that was you mean in, in the, involved in the truth? Yeah. No, no, yeah. Uh, yeah. See, you notice he's not answering because he's been paid not to. Right. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And I'll t- I t- I tell you what, when, when I can find these people who are paying me to cover all this stuff up, I'm going to be le- I'm gonna be loaded. I'm, oh, when we're off here, we'll all know all the truth. Trust me. Let us know, but, too. No, we're still yeah. looking as well. But the, 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 the step pyramid appears to have come out of a, 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 a long series of progressive steps in building so um lots of the very early dynastic uh, uh tombs were essentially what were called masterhoods so small square masterhood is the um is arabic word for bench so they were just these small squat things um and so you had these masterhoods being built for the kings they got to quite big levels there's a site called um Beit Khalif, which dates to the third dynasty out in like Middle Egypt, and you've got these masterpieces that are absolutely colossal, you know, r- extremely high. And before it was covered up, that I mean, this is another one of those things that people say covering up the truth. But um, the old Joseph Step Pyramid, you used to be able to see the original masterpiece that was at the bottom of this um, uh, uh, Step Pyramid, uh, which was then reinforced with um, buttress walls and then extended out even more. And then what seems to have been, seems to happen is Imhotep, who Joza basically credited with being this master craftsman and um, really kind of elevated him to this high role. And he was also deified in, in Egypt, I mean, throughout Egyptian history, um, as someone who, you know, invented building with stone. He then just basically started to stack masterbirds up on top of each other until he got you know six levels high um and it's quite telling that all of the um early fourth dynasty pyramids the pyramids of sneferu uh, the pyramid of sehemket of Saqqara, they all have this step pyramid core which was then essentially filled out to try and make it into a, a, a flat pyramid this pyramid of uh, maydoom which was built by Khufu's father um sneferu and the outer casing of the pyramid is completely all stripped away, and it's just left with this step core, which looks like an evolution of what the step pyramid was. Um, oh wait, wait! I gotta stop you right there. We we don't believe in evolution here. It was the creation <laughs> of the pyramid, not the evolution of. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. So it seems to have just been this this kind of gradual evolution of building. Um, that that. They've probably got more in common with the, you know, the the um, Sumerian ziggur- ziggurats than they have with the, um, you know, the, the South American pyramids. That makes sense. Because then we yeah, then we get into the whole well, where was this culture that came from? How did they share all of these building techniques? But there were no religious sharing. There was no technology sharing. There was no Wi-Fi obelisks, obviously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, out by Wi-Fi. <laughs> the uh dave's gonna put up a picture now of uh, we kind of we got into it a little bit when brian forster was here and it's the uh that secret chamber that had the robot go into you know yeah. you sent the picture with um you know the two knob things up top uh tell us what we're looking at here and, and walk us through what this is uh i can't see it uh, it, you're, you're on a little bit of a delay, but it's the uh, it's the the thing that looks like a tunnel with the two black holes up top. You know, uh, um, it's, uh, it's it's the the door that they found with that robot that went in and yeah, okay, yeah. So this this was kind of following on from uh, something that Brian said, where 
um, he basically mentioned that um, the uh, robot was sent up these shafts and um, they found this door and there was some copper cabling that they found and the Egyptian authorities didn't like it so they got rid of him, chucked him out, which is, I mean, it's not the case at all. Uh, I mean, just basically in brief, um, Rudolf Gantenbrink was a, a, you know, a German who approached the Supreme Council of Antiquities and said, I've got this idea, you've got these shafts and these pyramids, I'll build a little robot with cameras on, excuse me, we'll send them up these shafts and see what's there. So the Supreme Council of Antiquities kind of saw a little opportunity and they said, right, okay, we'll agree to this if while you're doing these excavations, you install ventilation in these shafts for us, because the pyramid inside gets really, really hot. Um, it can be quite claustrophobic. So while he was there, Gantabring installed these uh, uh, fans that are still in there today, and then he got essentially free. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm giving you the, the quick version of this. Huh. Uh, so he, the shafts in the king's chamber, basically, um, they don't go straight out from the king's chamber, they kind of go flat, and then they arc around a little bit, and then they go up maybe up about 40 degrees uh, straight to the outside of the pyramid. They're traceable, they go to the outside. The um, Queen's Chamber has shafts on a similar model, but they don't exit the uh, uh, chamber at all. So Gantenbrink, I think the, the, the pictures that I sent you were from the sub, southern shaft. He sent the robot up. You can see some slight subside, some sub, subside, <laughs> subsidence in the shaft. Mm -hmm. And you can even see there's a little red ochre line in one of the images that I sent you with the workers' marks of where they were marking out these uh, shafts. And it goes up and it's, you know, there's just a piece of limestone with, it looks like a couple of copper knobs uh, on it. So they, they weren't really expecting this. Um, so they had to bring the um, robot down, think, right, what are we going to do with this next? So um, again, after thinking about it, they got a little drill on the end with like a camera, sent the robot up again, drilled through the hole, uh, sent the camera in, and there's like literally a foot gap behind that door to another door. Um, in that gap, they had one of those like snake cameras that can snake around and you know take like a 360 uh, look. There were some ochre markings in there. They just look like numbers. Um, I think, uh, I can't remember the, it might have been James Allen um, said that they basically correspond to the number of cubits that the length of the shaft is. It's around about 120 Egyptian cubits, which mm -hmm. is, you know, from your elbow to your tips of your fingers. Um, but what the as for the stuff with the copper wiring and everything that's there, I mean, it's it's, it's not there. I don't know. I don't know where they're getting where they're getting that from, or where Brian. Are you sure, <laughs> Were these photos uh, photoshopped? Are you certain of this? There was, there's, there's a researcher called um, Christopher Dunn who suggests that the Great Pyramid of Giza is just a power plant. And you had um, uh, liquids pumped in via these shafts that would go down into the chamber, uh, mix in the chamber. I mean, for what reason, I don't know. I think he comes through to the end of it and saying that the, the Great Pyramid projected a um, uh, an energy shield that would deflect any kind of like meteorites that that came and hit. Um, of course it did. Yeah, but all of the machinery and everything that ran this was destroyed in some cataclysm because a meteorite came down and and hit the area and destroyed them. So that I mean, it didn't really work, did it? No. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. I I uh, I often say, um, and I have to be honest here. I don't. Um, I don't know that as of right now, I'm not saying that I can't be convinced, but um, I don't know if I can honestly say that the pyramids were built for the purpose of being a tomb because there's just nothing. It's not like the, uh, you know, the, the temple where uh, the Valley Temple where, you know, you, you found all of the, those you know dozens of mummies uh, from kings. Their chambers were elaborately. Uh, decorated with hieroglyphics and it was just like a big spectacle and there's just you don't see that in the, the pyramids i'm not saying that i'm saying that it, it wasn't a tomb i just don't know if i can say 100 percent that it that it was but i think that you can go through life 
by this one principle, and that is that life is always, always, always way more boring than you want it to be. Like the the truth is never going to be that the Egyptians were creating an energy shield to defend against uh, incoming meteorites. Uh, <laughs> no, that's actually, I believe that one. Uh, of course you do. But, but I see you believe that um, we can talk to one of them on the phone. No, that was, that well, was, tr that was Trump's, um, thing, you know, how he's getting the star Wars or not star Wars, um, space Marines. Yeah. He just did it, he just did it uh, retroactively and went back in time and started back in the, in the you know, those Egyptian days. I, I would actually believe that a lot sooner than if you'd have told me two years ago he would be president. I would much believe that he's <laughs> The Simpsons capable. predicted it. The Simpsons did predict it. And I'm not, I'm talking scarily so, so there's something to it. I know I saw that with the yeah. the escalator and all that. Yeah, so, is that freaky? So uh that's a good that's a good segue, I guess. Let's talk about what the the uh the actual pyramids themselves were used for. You brought up the shafts a second ago. And uh David, if you'll pull up that uh the picture of the uh, pyramid that has the the cutaway, and you can see the actual tunnels as they come down at angles. It, it looks like you're looking at the inside of the um, pyramid, but those those shafts. I don't, I don't, I don't think that I buy into this. Although they do line up, I don't know if it's coincidence or or not. But uh, let's start here, and before we get into the uh, the demit, you know the north south east west aligning perfectly the golden ratio all that stuff aside and talk about the shafts that jut out like you said and they claim that they match perfectly to two stars that are on either side of the um pier what, what's up steve oh no just kyle wants to talk about the shafts <laughs> i just thought that oh was yeah so, ah nice I, yeah <laughs> Well, have you anybody got that? Oh, please. I have a dirty mind. But, <laughs> but they, they line up to two shafts. If that's not the case, because I don't think it is, I think it's a coincidence. What were those um, shafts originally intended for? As, as for them lining up, um, they don't they don't directly line up to anything outside. I well, mean, not now. I'm talking about with, uh, if, well, they claim, this is what they claim, that you can take procession and rewind it back. Um, it, well, I mean, the, the the shaft, if you're standing, let's say, if we take the king's chamber shafts, if you're standing at the north shaft, um, it's maybe about five foot high. Um, hmm. It goes straight into the masonry for maybe 10 to 15 feet, um, curves off to the left, and maybe about another 20 or so feet, and then it climbs up straight through the masonry that way. I think if it was going to be pointing to something, it would just go directly straight out rather than go cut through this way through the masonry, then take another angle. Oh, I agree. Go straight up another way. Um, mm -hmm. As for if it points to a certain star, I mean, again, this is one of those things of what star? I mean, there must be lots of stars that are passing through that. If you're looking up through the shaft to a star, throughout the night, you know, you're just going to get a complete, but, you know, th th there are suggestions that it lines up to the circumpolar stars, which would fit right. in with ancient Egyptian religion in the pyramid texts. It's all basically related to the king wanting to go and join the circumpolar stars. That's where he's going to, you know, become mm -hmm. immortal and spend the rest of his life. Um, I've, I've never really bought into the king needing these shafts to go, to go up and, and join these stars or, or, or anything along those lines. I agree. Um, I don't, I don't specifically think they link up to stars. Um, I'm not entirely sure if they... I read a paper once about someone essentially saying that they represented the, the, the cosmic waterways of the king. If you look at lots of um, Middle Kingdom coffins, they have these paths of the underworld kind of drawn out in the base, and there's lots of rivers that seem to follow a similar kind of path. They'll go straight, take an angle, go straight up this way, and there were essentially maps for the deceased to find his way through the afterlife. And I heard someone suggest that these were probably these, you know, immortalized in stone within the pyramids. Again, I don't strictly buy into that. Um, I'm, I'm just going to be one of those that says I've got, I've got no idea. I don't know if they're architectural, if it was some way of them just keeping an eye on where the measurements of the layers of the pyramid were going as it was increasing in height. Um, I don't know why the Queen's Chamber ones are shut off and the King's Chamber ones go through to the 
exterior. I, I can answer that one. I think uh, I maybe he didn't like his queen in the real life, so he <laughs> made sure that he was not going to be joined by her in the afterlife. Well, I mean, there's, there's, this is the thing with the whole kind of um, uh, Giza Orion correlation that there was this plan that the pyramids were laid out in, in, in Orion to, to mimic Orion's belt that all of the pyramids on the plateau, the Great Pyramid, the Pyramid of Capra, the smaller Pyramid of Menkora, all show signs of changes in their building structure. Mm -hmm. um, so if there was some kind of divine plan that there was going to be doing this, you'd think it would all be kind of set up from the start, especially in Khufu's Pyramid. There's the, I don't know if you've still got the schematic up, but there's the descending passage that goes right down into the bottom of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. where there's a room there that's completely unfinished. It was just left. Then they're cutting um, up into the ascending passage, which was cut through the bedrock of the pyramid. So the, the pyramid above that height was built before this passageway was cut through. So they were cutting through the bedrock of the pyramid, and then they got to almost like the level where the queen's chamber is. They started building all of that superstructure, and it almost seems again that they kind of went, right, we don't need this. We're going to build something higher up. Um, plus Khufu, who was the first um, uh, pharaoh to build the pyramid on the plateau, and then you have his son Khafre and his son Menkaure. Um This is where the the Orion belt, you know, comes from. These three pyramids out in order, but it doesn't really take into account that Khufu had a son before Khafre, uh called Jedifre, who built his pyramid at Abu Rawash, which we spoke about earlier. So if there was this kind of Orion correlation plan, why did the sun go and build something five miles up north? And then they kind of came back and revisited the plan later on. Do you get what I mean? I'm, yeah. I'm not yeah. saying like it's impossible, but it's just... Sure. And even Robert Baval, when he was, you know, this was suggested to him, he started to think, well, Jennifer's pyramid must be representing another star. And he suggested it was something to do with the Taurus constellation or something like this. But when you start to put the star maps on top of the pyramid field maps, nothing aligns at all. It's just my, you know, you need to blow these maps up so big to match with the stars in the sky. Um, it, it just doesn't work. Yeah. I, uh, that, that I think could potentially be just a, you know, a unique coincidence, but what I, what I don't think is a coincidence or I don't see how this could, be a coincidence is their ability to have lined it up with, you know, a few fractions of a degree of true North and with, um, what was that other thing? I'm uh, looking at my notes here. The, uh, the fact that there is no other structure on earth that is this close to what, true north actually is and it happens to be the exact center of the planet in terms of land mass i th i think the thing with the measurements i mean it's obviously i mean the the the, the place is level to i mean i think there's there's maybe an inch or so out within each of the corners of the pyramid i mean it's, yeah it's level right so a fantastic level um there's been some experimental archaeology done where they've made um, troughs in the floor and fill these troughs with water and basically as long as you keep this outer trough level with the, the, the stone trough sorry, level with the water you're going to get a complete level base mm -hmm. so that's one suggestion that this may be how this thing has worked. There's been lots of other stuff as well with basically just looking at stars and just you know working out where certain stars are rising, planning them all out this way and it's quite interesting that all of the um, pyramids, they've got an extremely close um, ratio with the um, Great Pyramid, almost like, you know, certain, as the years were going on and, you know, the procession was happening and stars were filling up at different places, that the measurements were going slightly out of kilter. Um, but, I mean, it is an amazing fact that, you know, the pyramid is, is level to where it was. I think the... Um, the thing with it being in the, the, the geodesic center of the Earth is incorrect. As far as I know, that is about a thousand miles north. It's, it's somewhere up in Turkey. Um, 
that was another one of those things that I looked into years ago. Mm-hmm. Said, oh, this is amazing. How did they know all of this latitude and longitude and where this thing was? And, right. And, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think they did. And and I'm just uh, what I'm doing is I'm just throwing out uh, now generalization. Oh you know, no, no. General, these, no, these are not things that, that that I'm going to argue with you because I, I I tend to agree with with you, but I'm just yeah. putting out there the the different ideas that so everybody again. I do not believe in aliens. I'm just playing devil's advocate. Um, no, I mean, again, I, no, 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 wait. We believe in aliens. I think you believe. In, I believe in aliens. I just don't think. Oh yeah, gonna, yeah, they, yeah. Just not yeah, yeah. here. Yeah, not yeah, yeah. They're not coming here, people. They're they're like fuck that place. That area is quarantined. <laughs> yeah, wait. That's where G-Man lives, right? No, we're not heading over there. Oh right? yeah, no G-Man. <laughs> well, there, there are lots of there are lots of you know references to. Um, I mean, that that just recently there was a. Um, uh, 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 site found at a place called Wadi El Jar on the Red Sea, which was an old kingdom port, and they found a lot of papyri that were uh, buried there, which was of a worker called uh, Merwer, who was um, basically shipping stone to the pyramid of Khufu. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know it was that because it's called Ache Khufu. It, it's literally the name of the Great Pyramid. So he's basically giving these lists of days where he's like, you know, day two, Sailing north to Chora, um, day three, going south to Akit Kofu, delivering this stone. We've got lots of lists of this. There's, um, there's a, um, oh, I think the gentleman's name is Mr. Um, Benebhen, who was a, a, an official um, in the um, later, well, Middle Old Kingdom, where he's talking about the time when the king Menkaure um, picked him a tomb. Uh, a place where he could build his tomb on the Giza Plateau as he was inspecting the construction of his pyramid. So we've got loads and loads of little references like this. Um, and there's also, um, I'm not entirely sure if you know about this, but in the um, in the late you know, New Kingdom, there was a, a series of um, trials of tomb robbers. So basically down in Thebes, there was um, all of the tombs in the Valley of the Kings um, the Valley of the Queens were all getting robbed. And basically, um, there was this huge inquisition about it. All of the busyism and everything were involved. And there was lots of politics that were going on as well, because this was um, found out by a, a, a mayor of the West Bank of Thebes and not the major mayor at the time. And so there was this big thing of like, well, if he hadn't been reporting it, he must have been involved with it. So he basically announced this, huge inspection. We're going to go around and look at all of these tombs that have apparently been robbed. And there was um, a Dra Abuel Naga, which is down in Thebes, or a set of, you know, 11th dynasty pyramids that were um, built just outside the Valley of the Kings. And we have these accounts of the, um, um, basically the administration going along and inspecting these pyramids to see if they've been robbed or not. And they found that some of them had been robbed. And then we have the confessions of the tomb robbers saying, yeah, we, we broke into these pyramids and here's how we did it. And here's what we stole. And here's what, so you've literally got the Egyptians themselves saying, you know, we broke into these pyramids. The king was buried in there. I mean, I don't know if you've you've got a minute if you want to read a very small section. Mm-hmm. You'll probably take a minute of one of these texts. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, is, is that not too boring? No, no, not at all. What, what are we talking about again? So okay. this is this okay, is. Okay, I, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's so great. Ba- basically, this, there's been this, uh, there's basically um, papyrus um, BMEA 10054, um, papyrus Abbott, um, papyrus uh, Amherst Leopold the second or third, I think it is, that are detailing all of these lists of all of these robberies that are, that are going on. So just really quickly, there here's. This is just a translation from one of the books. I've translated these texts myself, but they basically say, after this inspection was made, total pyramid complexes of former kings examined on this day, um, found intact nine, found profaned one, total ten, and then they basically go through and you know list some of these other uh, um, uh, divine oratrices, these uh, the Theban temple singers, um, found intact, found profane to each. And then um, basically they went to all of the tombs of the nobles in Thebes 
and found that all of those were robbed, everything was stolen, their inhabitants were all kicked out. And um, in one of these uh, depositions of the robber, he basically, they get, they get him and say, what have you been doing? How have you been breaking into these pyramids? And he gives this big list of names. So he basically, he gives all of these names of the people that he was with. And then he says, um, quoting him here, we have to commu commit thefts in the funerary monuments in the manner which we quite regularly conform. We found that the complex of the pyramid of King Sekem Reshed Pawi, the son of Ray Sobekemshaf, that was his other um, name, was not on the same model of the pyramids that we habitually went into break. So we basically saying we found this other pyramid, but the tomb shafts differed. Um, we took our picks of copper and we broke into the pyramid of this king in search of its innermost part. We found its lower apartment. We took our torches and we descended. We removed the backfill. We found the god, so i.e. the dead king, um, lying in his grave. We found the grave of the royal wife, Nubka, may she live, the royal wife, in the space behind him. Um, we immediately removed it and found her there. So they're breaking through the walls of the pyramid. We found the august mummy of this king provided with a scimitar while a great number of amulets and gold shoes were on his neck. His mask was on him and the venerable, venerable mummy of this king was entirely covered in gold. His coffins were extensive with silver within and without and encrusted with every sort of precious stone. We collected the gold that we found on this august mummy of this god as well as the amulets and the jewels which won his neck and the coffins which he rested. We found the royal wife in exactly the same condition. We also collected everything that we found on her. We set fire to the coffins, we took their accessories, which we found with them and which consisted of the utensils of silver and copper. We made a division among them of ourselves. We made eight shares of the gold we had found on these two gods and of their mummies, amulets, jewels and coffins, so that 20 devon of gold fell to each of the eight, that's how much they got each, which makes 120 devon of gold, not counting the smashed equipment, and then we crossed over towards these. So they're basically mm -hmm. saying, we went to this pyramid, we broke into it, we found the king, we nicked all of his stuff and set fire to everything. This is why you don't find right. you know, any remains in any of the pyramids. What happened all... to these, uh, does it say what happened to these thieves? thieves? Yeah, ba basically, um, during all of these interrogations, they were essentially brought forward and said, tell us what you know about these robberies. If you were wise, you kept your mouth shut because all of the people who kept their mouth shut basically didn't get punished. Now, they were beaten with sticks. They would get beaten. What the Egyptians would do is they would basically sit you down. They would tie your hands together, tie your feet together and get huge sticks and smash the bottom of your feet until you talked. So they would be beating these people and say, tell us what you know, tell us what you know. They say, I don't know anything, honest, governor. I really don't know anything. And then they'd be right, all right, off you go. And then other people they'd get in, they'd say, right, tell us what you know about these robberies. They'd say, oh, I don't know anything. They'd give them a good beat and say, wait, 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 I'll tell you everything. And then they'd go on and say, you know, I went up to this tomb, I did this. Or even, not even that, even just cases of, I knew somebody, I told him where we could go to go and get some of this bread, which is their like euphemism for saying, right. uh, uh, get some money. So, um, and then they divvy out all of this money between them. Uh, what, what the usual punishment was, um, if they weren't impaled on, on you know, impalement was a, a usual method what? of splashing. But- um, like Vlad, the, Vlad the Impaler kind of impaled? Yeah, literally there's a, for, for um, <sighs> the, the torture, there's literally a hieroglyph of a spike with a body on the top of it they say that they were they oh were see well you know there. i mean if i if i was being spiked and it's this way i'm cool with that is the other way not so much yeah yeah well that's just the hieroglyph i don't i don't know about oh, okay. the actual the actual physical method. oh my but, entire but, body hurts right now but lots of the others they would if if they weren't um they would usually say i'll tell you the truth on pain of having my nose and my ears cut off so they'd slice what? your nose off and slice your ears off Wow, people back man, people back then were. This is this is one of the this is one of the things that um, um, why I'm interested in in like people in Egypt. Lots lots of people's conceptions of Egypt. Um, it, it's essentially not an Egypt that I recognise. Lots of people think that the ancient Egyptians were just you know walking around in flowery robes, looking at the stars, conducting mathematics, and you know all of this kind of thing. Um, 
they, they were very, very savage when they wanted to be, just like everybody else was at this, you know, period. They could be very barbaric. I mean, there's this text where they would go out into battle. Uh, I'm sure you know that when the um, came, when warriors would go out into battle to prove that they had um, done something for the king, that they've been brave in battle, they'd literally hack the hands off um, enemies that they killed and bring them back for them to be counted. Did you know that? No. No, I did not know that. So, so uh, literally, on, on the temple walls of Medina Habu, the, the funerary temple of Ramesses III, there are scribes standing in front of piles of hands, and there are tomb biographies where they literally say, I went out, I smashed these three people, I brought back their hands, and the herald let it know that, you know, I did this. And then they were rewarded with gold, rewarded with slaves. Um, yeah, I mean, I would never make it back then. Never. I would be, <laughs> I would be dead in no time. Uh, I couldn't chop people's hands off. I couldn't uh, lift heavy blocks on the pyramid. I, there's nothing I could do. I could sit around. We could have non sequitur, like I guess, from the pyramid blocks live, and then that would be the only thing I could offer to society. I think <laughs> nothing else. Uh, so we uh, were hitting the the 90 minute mark now which always happens and I, I do it feels like we just started this and yeah. again not an area that i know a lot about so i've been kind of you know hesitant to kind of ask too many questions but has it, it, i can't believe it's literally been 90 minutes yes um it, which is a good thing that means you're just gonna have to we just have to bring you back to Come uh, back again, yeah. but um <laughs> i want to uh while steve uh, guys if you have any uh anything you want said on the show super chats we read all those on um the air before we go off Steve will be collecting those in the next five minutes. So if you have a question that you want to get out there, um, put that in the uh, the live chat. Um, I want to kind of, I guess, wrap up. And this is going to kind of, uh, this opens up a broader topic that you, we could dive into. But uh, I, I just wanted to kind of hit it easy. <laughs> hit it, that, was a, that was a bad choice of words. I, I apologize. <laughs> hit it easy was a bad choice of words. Um, I, I kind of want to just generally hit this this topic because we'll dive into it deeper um next time and that is how they were built because there's a lot of um you know contention there's so many theories about you know whether it was an internal ramp or uh wetting sand and sliding blocks and recently i heard that they found some uh channels that ran past the pyramids where the the guy that you mentioned earlier that kept the journal about shipping blocks that uh, they actually built a channel that would have water flow down and they would ship the blocks from the quarry down there to the pyramids that way you know just on a a, a man built channel that would go past that so there's all kind of theories out there what do you consider being the most probable now and then when you come back we can kind of hit that topic in more detail. So, I mean, the, the, the diaries of Moa are basically specific that all of the stone from the quarries, specifically from Shura, were shipped on boats. Um, so you've yeah. got to think of Egypt at this time of, of not just being desert. You, you know, there's this inclination that you think of Egypt as being as dry as a bone. You know, back then you had the inundation. So lots of the time it was like, you know, really, really flooded. And there's evidence that just um, in front of the Sphinx and extending around slightly, that was a harbour. That was essentially water came up to there. Mm -hmm. um, and so the boats would come in from Chura, deliver the stone to the harbours. They would be dragged up the causeways. Um, and Herodotus says this in his book, um, The History, that he was basically saying that the... Um, the, the, the causeway of the Great Pyramid took around 10 years to construct. And I mean, whether you believe that or not. Um, and then the, the stone was basically taken up the, the causeway to the actual main pyramid site. Um, as for how they were constructed, I mean, again, there's no evidence. There's no schematic. There's none of this. Right. You can basically go by Herodotus said he was told by you know, the priests of the, of the time that were moved, they were moved by wooden machines. And he, he says how it was done, but no one actually managed to work out exactly what he means by it, that there was 
a wooden trolley on one level that would raise the stone up to another level. And there's been lots of people experimenting with how this thing would work. And I don't know. But on the uh, south of the, the Great Pyramid, there are the remains of ramps just going up. There's a, there's a few small ramps that are, are, are going up to the base of the pyramid. So there's, there's got to have been some kind of like ramp involved in some way. Now, yeah. whether it's kind of, I, there's, I don't think there's any way on earth that it was just one single ramp like you see in the 10,000 BC, that film or whatever. With, right. You know, mammoths dragging the stone up or anything like that. I had to be a mammoth, possible. though. That, <laughs> was, that was badass. <laughs> it was a good scene. It was, I, I, still, I still really enjoyed it. I, see, I love shit like that. Like when it's all of the, oh, these people who came from the stars and they, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, buy, in, I buy into it. They didn't have tractor um, beams? <laughs> well, you know the Noah had rock people that helped him build the ark. If you saw, uh, if you saw the movie Noah with Russell Crowe, those, um, those, did you see that? No, I haven't seen that. Okay, yet, well, no. they interpreted. I don't know how, but they interpreted the Bible to where there's actual these rock creatures, like they're they're rocks, they're big human shaped rocks, and they are the ones that are clearing the forest and dragging the wood over to uh, to Noah. I shit you not. They, these are rock people. Like was, was that is not in Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit or something? No, it's Ooh, in rock, Noah. Rock giants or something. I promise you, I, I was baffled by it too because that was during my yeah. uh, my Christian days. And when I went and saw that, I remember sitting in the movie. It's so funny to think about this, but I was going, "This is heresy." Like I need to get out of. It. <laughs> but the the entire thing is is on equal playing field now. You know, looking back, it's like a, a guy who lives to be nine hundred that can clear an entire forest and build a boat to ship two of every animal on the planet around for uh, 40 days and 40 nights is on par with actual men coming up out of stone and clearing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the rock golem thing isn't really a far cry from, you know, except Not at all, there, but too, that's, that's true. They, they yeah, put rock I, people in there. I got to tell you, I, I so was um, in tune with Megan the other day uh, on that whole, you know, this was not meant to be a literal story. You know, that these ages were not meant to be taken literal. I just, I'm so on, on board with that. And when you try to make these things literal, it just is bizarre. It yeah. wasn't meant to be. But anyways, we do got, we got three, three questions, I guess, for the most part. Um, not too uh, intricate, but so, you know. Uh, first person wants to know, what is beneath the Sphinx? Anything interesting? Um, I guess maybe there was a void or something discovered. The Hall of Records. No. Um, <laughs> have, they, have they determined as, if that's a completely solid or if there's a chamber in there at all? I, th I think the, the, the last thing that I heard about it, basically under the Sphinx, there's, there's, um, there's groundwater there, which is also helping to contribute to the deterioration of the monument. Um, they've done several drilling um, expeditions, if you like, down underneath the Sphinx to try and drain away. I've, I've literally been there where they've been pumping this water out from the water table underneath the Sphinx. Um, Lots of the, they did some, um, um, uh, I can't remember the, the technique. Sorry, it's getting to about maybe three in the morning here. So I'm kind of, uh, um, oh, yeah. they did, they did, they did lots of, um, kind of like magnetic resonance stuff with the floor of the Sphinx, found what they say is chambers. The issue there is that, um, limestone is really, really, there's lots of, uh, cracks, lots of gaps, lots of gullies in this limestone. So it's just a case of determining is this result that you're getting back from, you know, the kind of scan that you've done, is it an actual um, constructed chamber or is it just like an empty chasm or gap or something like this in the limestone? I feel like such a dick, by the way. I, I, I always forget that the fact that people over in the UK are way ahead of of us and it <laughs> it is almost 3 a.m yeah, no, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's fine i'm not I'm, I'm not i'm not falling asleep it's just that i'm not kind of like yeah but i still feel I'm like a can, can you give me the lottery number tickets for tomorrow <laughs> over here? i mean would you do that cool um, yeah I'll, I'll email I, them over after i don't want everyone to get involved so. i i don't blame you i don't blame you. i just <laughs> want to be the only winner um next question sort of a broader question uh if there was an older civilization that could carve up sandstone in Egypt, would we necessarily know it to be the case? Um, again, I, I, I think it's, I think because of the colossal effect that human beings have on their environment, I think that any kind of civilization that would have left 
any kind of any of these big monuments had any of the kind of methodology or, or techniques to um, conduct operations like this, you know, large scale quarrying, um, they would have left some traces behind. This is another, again, I'm, I'm not going to jump into this too much, but this is another one of the things that Graham Hancock, with his lost civilization, mm. um, basically used to speculate that answering this question of there's, there's no evidence for anyone being around, he'd say, well, they all kind of like left and they're all in Antarctica and we can't get to there because now it's covered in ice. But then as soon as Gebekli Tepe comes up, they're kind of like, oh, okay, no, now Gebekli Tepe, that dates to, you know, nearly 10,000 BC. Yeah. Um, so this is evidence for a culture at the time that could have done this. Kind of forgetting that if not in Egypt, Gebekli Tepe wasn't like a, a massive large scale project like the pyramids were. You know, Clash Schmidt and all of the researchers that I think essentially, again, this is the thing I was talking about with context that you take Gebekli Tepe out of context and you can basically turn it into what it is. It's forgetting all of the other sites that are known hunter gathering sites all around the area that would have, you know, come into Gebekli Tepe and used this uh, place for, you know, whatever reason that they used it. Um, so, yeah. Getting back to the question, um, I, I just find it hard that these big ancient societies would have come, done whatever it is that they need to be doing, you know, they kind of tidy up on the way out and leave no trace that they were there. Well, the thing is to answer that question, though, um, the, the answer is obvious that these were tools that were able to carve these things in such a way, an intricate level at that particular time that they couldn't just leave them. So when the alien, the last alien spaceship left, they had to take everything with them to use on other planets. It's, it's one of these funny things that I always hear, like you, you hear that these, oh, they used um, um, diamond um, tipped saws to cut through this stone. And they were so important that, you know, they would have been kept guard all the time. And it's just, well, not a single diamond has been found anywhere in any site in Egypt in any context. So it's like, yeah. Are they picking up afterwards? Or, yeah. <laughs> they just picked them up. Yeah. Uh, one last question. Uh, what is the most significant missing piece of evidence that Egyptologists hope to recover and to fill in the gaps of knowledge? I, oh, that's a question. I mean, uh, do you think they're going to find something like, I mean, obviously, like, like with the Rosetta Stone, that actually was able to translate, uh, you know, hieroglyphs, obviously. So yeah. that was a big thing. Do we think we're going to find anything out there eventually going to be like, you know what? We didn't know this about them before. And this is a huge amount of information that we just uh, didn't the know. Arc, duh. The Ark. The Ark. Well, um, the Ark. Do you know the Ark? Do you know that we have somebody that actually argued that the Ark um, of the Covenant was a nuclear power source that Moses used to part the Red Sea? Everybody knows that. I'm talking about the actual Ark Ark, the wooden Ark. No, I'm talking about the Ark of the Covenant. That was nuclear powered. So I've, I've also heard the Ark of the Covenant fits into the copper inside the Great Pyramid absolutely perfectly. And that, that's oh. That's why the corner was blown off because the power that was in there and yeah. doesn't everybody know this already i mean I know, yes it, it well, obviously I, was a nuclear power I, I, yeah. I think i think obviously if if um let's say if there was some um tomb found with a bunch of papyri basically saying oh look here's a, here's a plan for the pyramids i mean that that would be you know we, you could probably put all of these arguments uh to bed for once and for all but I think I think even then you could literally get um, some huge papyrus with the plans of the pyramids. Here's how we build them. Here's the machine. Here's the rate that we were dropping the stones in, and people would say, "Oh well, no, this is just this is written later. This is kind of how they thought that they were, you know." Yeah, I um, I think that uh, we are stoked that you reached out to us. We're surprised that you reached out to us, especially with some of the uh, the videos that you probably no doubt saw on our channel. But nonetheless, yeah. we are uh, happy that you did. Um, I, I sent Dave a picture that um, maybe he can put it up, and if he can't, he can just let me know. But um, this is this is something else that I am going to move to to try to do a show about. I've just got to find somebody that can speak to this. And uh, it's difficult because there's only a certain amount of people that are allowed to actually be in the same room where this door is. But there is a temple in India, and 
I cannot even for the if my life depended on it, would not ever be able to pronounce it. It's um, I'm going to attempt it just for the humor, so you guys can have something to laugh at. But it's uh, Padmana Haba Wasabi. Wasabi. Everything sounds better ending in wasabi anyway, so we'll just go. With it. <laughs> but it's it's this temple in India, and uh, basically the story behind it is, and I'm going to tell you this because if somebody's out there and you know someone that can speak to this. Uh, and you're you're obviously made it this far with us tonight, so you like the history aspect. But this is fascinating to me. There is uh, a chamber in this temple. It's one of the oldest temples in India. And the in the bottom level of this temple, there were these, I think, uh, half a dozen rooms that were sealed off. And uh, several years ago, they got the Indian government got permission or granted permission to go in and excavate all but, uh, I believe, two of one. these chambers. Yeah, well, obviously one, but I think there was one more other. Oh, yeah, yeah, then they, we, oh, you're right, because yeah, they the, later on, right. Yeah, there was one other side that they, they didn't give grant permission to, but yeah. um, they found, I mean, untold treasures in this place. I mean, they, it was it was like a trillion dollar price tag, everything added up. That's how many, like, just prices artifacts were in here. So then there's this room that I hope that you're being able to see right now. It's a, uh, it's got two serpents on the doors. The, it has been sealed off since it, the temple was created. No, no one has ever been inside there. And uh, they say that all who pass beyond this door, uh, it's a curse. So there are several theories of why they or what they think is back there. They think that there's, you know, a treasure that's worth it's priceless beyond there's being guarded. They uh, detect some high levels of mer uh, mercury in the uh, the soil around the area. So they think it's protected by um, maybe mercury in there. So the government put it out to the people of India. Uh, you guys can vote on whether or not we should go in and see what's inside of this chamber and the people rose up you know they said oh, it hasn't been unsealed since it was created this is it, they're very religious in um in, in india obviously with hinduism and so they voted overwhelmingly not to go into this this chamber and i would like to speak to somebody who has an idea or has read the inscription you know themselves or, or works in that kind of field to get more history not only on the temple aspect like when it was built, why it was built, uh, these other chamber rooms, why they haven't been looted, you know, up until the government kind of went in and did that thing. So if you or anyone you know is a uh, a, a cursed mercury-laden autologist, please. I know someone. Um, let's get, actually, uh, I think it's pronounced, I'm going to try to do this myself, but I think it's pronounced Pad, Padmana Paswami. But oh, uh, pastrami is even better. Pastrami, yes, we love pastrami. No, pad, <laughs> Padmana pastrami, that's pa, 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 Padmana Baswami. But Ganesh actually, I think, knows about this. I reach out to him. Yeah, um, yeah, we, yeah, see, if, see what he can, see what he can find out for us. But uh, even still, even with we can bring Ganesh on too. But if if there are other people out there that know about it too, it'd be cool to get it kind of a consist, you know, a couple people on here because. I think that it's uh it's fascinating to dive into that. It's almost as fascinating as uh, the the one thing I would love to have a episode on, but we can't because there's no one that knows about them because they're the only people that know about them, and, and those are the people who inhabited or still to this day inhabit North Sentinel Island. They're the only <laughs> true. They're the only group. No, of yeah, no. Can you imagine getting one on though as a guest? It'd be, it'd be like we we would be dead. The, yeah, we'd be dead. He'd be killing you, us. Uh, hey, Tony, have you heard of North Sentinel Island? No. Okay, so there's an island right off the coast of India um, called North Sentinel Island, and it's got a population on this island of they they think between uh, 1,500 and 10,000 people on this island, and this island has not been touched by human uh, by you know the modern world ever. The only two people that have gotten on that beach were two fishermen who uh, got stranded in like 1999 and um, the, the current took them to the island and they were killed on the island. But um, they don't even have fire yet. They have, they, you know, they've surveyed the area aerially and um, there's no sign that this group of people have even discovered what fire is yet. So they are living in a world that is just like it was 
uh, BC. So it wow. sounds like some areas of the UK, to be honest. <laughs> really? Well, people people who still kind of look at look at planes in the sky and go, oh, oh yeah, 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 I got you. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, these people, they're they're that you can go on YouTube and 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 um search for it. It's North Sentinel Island, and they were trying to bring aid to them at one point. They were trying to make contact and and you know do that whole thing carefully, and they were spearing the helicopters. I mean, just I, I think no, you said that. I was just going to say, were these the people bow bow and arrowing the helicopters? yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They thought they were probably like evil spirits or something. I mean, just uh, you just have to stop it and think about that for a second. Like, if you're a group of people, you've never seen something like a, a helicopter flying overhead at you. Yeah. Or you see two people in a boat, and it, it looks like these people are just walking on water. Emerging from the sea. Yeah. Right. I mean, hell yeah, you're going to spear the shit out of those things. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that, that's fascinating to me. But, um, uh, Tony, thank you very much for uh, coming on. This was absolutely fascinating i uh i think that you were brilliant at how you answered those questions and um, they're He's not smart dude yeah and they're not like i said in most cases real life is a lot less uh dramatic and you know unexplained you know unexplainable and unbelievable than in um what people think or people create just because we have a question like tony you said i don't know and as one of your answers. And I think that is the most underused answer mm -hmm. that's, that's out there. I think people try to make up an answer before they'll admit that they don't know. And that's where uh, a lot of this stuff started, you know, it, and that's what's I think wrong with, there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know. And in, in most cases, that's even more of a respectable answer. I think it's but, just the way it's like the way the human brain works though, isn't it? It's yeah. like we, we can't process nothing being there. So if, yeah. if they fill know. in the blank. The human it, mind definitely wants to fill in the blanks with something, even if that, it, they don't have. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's, like, it's like if you if you know if you're going to say to somebody what would win in a fight, you know, a table or a chair, you know, people know that it's a stupid question, but they'll they'll conduct a good argument as to why a chair would be. A <laughs> I table. would just say that neither one exists. <laughs> that would be. You know what though? That is still a more appropriate question than is the Earth flat. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, take a take a, a minute or two and um, let people know if uh, I, I don't know if you um, want to, but you can uh, plug your social media where people can follow you if you want. They can find out, you know, kind of keep up with you. And well, and yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm basically I, I have a Twitter. So you can jump onto Twitter. It's just Indy Wannabe, as in uh, Indiana Jones, Indy Wannabe. Uh, and I'm also on YouTube as well. I started my YouTube account maybe about a year ago. I did two translations of two Egyptian texts and then left it. But the, this has kind of like spurred me on a little bit. I've got three things that I'm recording at the minute that are going to be uploaded there soon, where I'm going to be tackling these kind of questions a little bit more in depth. Excellent. You know, going into real detail about some of these stuff. So like who built the pyramids, you know, who constructed the Sphinx, this, that, and the other. Excellent. Um, I like and, to see that. My YouTube channel there is Wannabe Indie. So it's the other way around. So Indie Wannabe on Twitter, Wannabe Indie on YouTube. Um, but again, if you know, if you get any uh, feedback from this, you know, if there's any other alternative people that want to jump on and yeah. have a chat, please count me in. I'll be um, awesome. happy. I, and um, I didn't know that you had a channel uh, uh, up until this point, but uh, we will link that as well in the... Uh, description below and um anytime you put out videos or anything like that put it uh tag us in on twitter and um we will push that out absolutely i think that's awesome oh, yep. well, dude. fantastic and, and i like to thank you too tony this was fascinating um do you want to uh you want to do on the outro the voicemail it's not very long and this was sent to my personal voicemail oh yeah i'm fine with that yeah yeah so what what do i say uh, his, his, he's got a, uh, while they've cues that up, Steve has a, um, a, this is why I'm looking for a, a new co-host. I'll be dead Tony, within the end of the week. We decided though yesterday that, that we would hold, um, at least let Steve be involved, but we're going to hold American Idol style uh, competition <laughs> for, uh, for a new co-host. But Steve has a roommate that is eventually going to uh, kill him at some point. Attempted, attempted. I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah. But, um, he's crazy and he likes to leave, uh, voicemails and long dear John letters. So, um, one, really of, them, one of them is very explicit and goes into great detail about what him and Steve oddly did some night when they were both drunk. And, um, we've all been so there. 
There's something to be said about this, yes, but the connotations, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> maybe I'm, maybe I'm. There maybe was physical I'm contact. Playing. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm embellishing a little yeah. bit. But yes, go ahead and play the, uh, let's hear what the next chapter of this saga is. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. Almost it's almost, which one is it? <laughs> I, he th I don't know. How, I, I don't understand. I don't think he understands what perjury is because perjury yeah, is perjury in court. By the way, I never testified. I didn't okay. have to. Okay, look, this, listen. So I got a I question, Steve, and the audience can hear me right now. It's a sure. three minute file, but that was a 33 second message. Is there anything left in this file? of? Uh, is there like an Easter egg? Oh <laughs> shit! I don't know. I thought I thought there was longer. There's nothing else. At the Let's uh, let me let me throw this out there too. Um, and 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 I'm in some ways joking, but in many ways I am not. Oh, they couldn't hear it. By the way, I'm sorry. I don't think that you should uh, file a restraining order against him because I think that this is something that should definitely be talked about on this show between the two of you. Yeah, no, I'm okay with it being on the show, and I'm okay. Putting it out there, I think it's hilarious. But uh, they didn't hear the, the voicemail on the outside chat. It well, just, it wasn't. It wasn't long. Play you played again, but it's just dead air. But we do need to. We do need to get off eventually. We're still, Tony, we're still Tony, it's three a.m. I know, but oh. that's what I'm saying. Tony's it's three a.m. for Tony. I don't want to. Well, Tony could take. It, 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 I was just gonna say, do you want to try to play it again? I'm all right for a minute. Yeah. It's just... Yeah. Okay. I right, uh, Dave, they didn't hear that on the outside. Yeah, we'll play it. We'll play it one more time. But um, but yes, this is going to be something that needs to happen on the show. I think. I agree. I'm okay with that. <sighs> oh well, that sucks. Well, you we'll, know what? I can I can play it. I can do it here. I I'll do it the old fashioned. We'll, we'll play it for you. Um, I got, what I got, are you going to do? Wait, I got it right here. Secret agent man. Secret agent man. Look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Thank you for all those gifts. That can be used in court. It's called contempt of court. It's called perjury. Thank you for all those gifts. It's almost 30. And have a nice evening. That voicemail is is that voicemail he's is deranged, is man. Is, is contempt. <laughs> I told you he's fucking deranged. But okay, so uh, guys, we are now going to say good night. We're going to leave you on that beautiful note. Oh, there's more. There's more. We are going to. Why did why did we have to? <laughs> That's it. That's it. It's not playing anymore. It's done. It's done. It's done. Steve, come okay. back to us. So, so we're gonna we're gonna finally let uh, let uh, let Tony go and get some rest. But right, Tony, uh, we will go into this uh, more in detail later on this week about Steve's roommates. We'll catch you up, and then we will work to get Steve's roommate, ex roommate, on the show. That was a teaser. There's three minutes of voicemail, so we have more. So we need to make this about. happen. We need to make this happen. <laughs> You, want him on. you know what? I would actually do it, I think, just for the fuck of it. Just because yeah. I like the, 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 my our viewers. <laughs> just because I think they would get a kick out of seeing this guy on air. Yeah, I think it'd be I, I think it'd be fantastic. Do. That'll be our good uh, that'll be our season finale. Yeah. Okay. We'll see you tomorrow, guys, at eight o'clock for um urine drinking, uh sovereign land seeking, flat earth. Being the center of the universe, dumpster firing at eight p.m. <laughs> I bought whiskey for tomorrow. Actual whiskey. I forgot who recommended it, but I did. So good you'll night. Need it. You'll need it.